Hi everyone and welcome to lab one for Elect 2507. Today we're going to be running you through your very first lab in this course. Um, to start, basically what you're going to have to do is go through the very first video that I've posted on how to create your account and all that. And once you're set up there, we can go ahead and you can fill out your pre-lab. And once that's done, we will go ahead and begin the lab. So the first step it asks you uh, is measuring your resistance values. Um, in this case, we're using electronic software, so we can uh, fine tune the, the value of our resistance values uh, to any value we want. So we can use the exact values that are used uh, on, on the page here. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and construct the circuit as shown in figure 3B, as shown in 4.1.2. So in this circuit, we will not have to um, actually put any of this stuff in for right now. This is our voltage supply and this is our internal resistance which is included within this voltage supply. So basically all we're creating is from here over from the first part. So we're just creating this part of the circuit. So let's go ahead and drag all the components we need down. So we need one, two, three, and four resistors. Go ahead and flip that one. Drop some ground nodes down. All right, now that that's done, let's go ahead. And I'm going to use different values in this lab than you will actually use. So I'm gonna keep my values of 1K right there and I'll use a value of 2K for that resistor. So I'm gonna switch my load to what you guys were specified as 220 ohms. And after that, I will, it's asking me to go back down. Too far. So, now it wants us to use a multimeter and measure the input resistance at port 1. So, this is port 1 between that node and that node. Let's go ahead and place an ohmmeter. At that particular position going to run it. So we can see my equivalent resistance for this particular circuit here in the R in is 742 ohms. So from there it wants us to now remove RL. So now if we go ahead cut these wires here. Oh. Move this guy over. And we'll put the ohmmeter on the output now. So now we'll go ahead and run the circuit again. 
and we can see my output resistance. So from here, we can go and infer what uh, these measurements actually mean uh, in relation to our pre-lab calculations, and we can explain any differences between the two values that we may have. So from there, we're going to turn on the DC power supply and set the various supply output to 5 volts. So we're going to fully put in the rest of the circuit. Put a ground node on the back of that source. And it says, the first load we will find is in unloaded condition, so without any load here. So we'll go ahead and set this to 5 volts, just like that. And then if we go ahead and run the transient, we can see my nodal voltage at this node is 2.5 volts. And the nodal voltage over here is 5 volts. So if I go V out, divided by V in, I should have my gain. In this case, I have a gain of 0 0.5 volts per volt. So from there, we can infer what this uh, value corresponds to in the pre-lab. Next, we will go ahead and pause the circuit again. And we'll connect now this 220 ohm load. And now we'll measure the V out and the V in. And we will again find the gain. In this case, my gain is around 0 0.152. So after I've done that, then it asked me to repeat the calculation, or sorry, ex first explain why the gain is lower in this case than with unloaded conditions. And then I will repeat this process with a 120 ohm load. So let's go ahead and move this to 120 ohms. So once that's at 120 ohms, the circuit should update in a couple seconds. And from there, we can see my V out divided by V in. And now we have 484 millivolts, so it's 0 0.484 divided by 5, uh, which is a gain of around 0 0.1 volt per volt. And that's with some rounding. So from there, we can um, go ahead and we're going to measure the short circuit current in our circuit. So this is going to allow us to find a, a value for V thevenin. So we have already found that value for V thevenin, right? Which is in Our V feminine was already calculated in 4.2.2, or sorry, 4.2.3. When we measured the voltage at both ports to find the transfer function. So these are unloaded conditions, right? So in this case is measuring the true V feminine voltage in this case. So from there, we have V thevenin. Now we're going to measure our I short circuit, which is ISC. And from there, we'll have a calculation that says R thevenin equals V thevenin over I short circuit, which is something you should be familiar with from two, five, or the first electronics course that you took. Um, from there, 
let's go ahead and we're going to place an ammeter in series with this circuit. An ammeter is something you haven't actually used yet probably, but uh, it's very simple. As a, a voltmeter goes in parallel, so it would go um, across one of these elements from here to here. An ammeter, like we have here, actually just goes in series with the circuit. So it just adds another element to the circuit, just like this. Just connect those nodes up. So for this calculation, it wants us to connect VO to ground. So we can go ahead and remove that connection. And we'll connect that directly to ground. So from here, we're running it with a five volt source still. And we can see that I have seven and a half milliamps going into there. From here, I can find out that my R7 value is around 333.3333 ohms, definitely. So, um, it wants us to calculate the and resistance based on your measurements. We've just done that. And now explain any difference between measured and corresponding pre-lab exercises. So, next we're going to turn off the DAC power supply and disassemble your circuit. And we're going to build the Thevenin equivalent circuit. So, the Thevenin equivalent circuit just consists of a single resistor. and a DC source. And a load. So in this case, our V Thevenin is going to be two and a half volts, because that's what we calculated. And this now will be our R Thevenin. So we're going to get that as close to the value as we possibly can. All right, once we're there, let's connect back the 220 ohm load. And once we've done that, we'll go ahead and hit run again. So now we can see we have 995 millivolts there. If we go ahead. Sorry, I stand corrected to actually measure the short circuit current. I'm just going to connect the circuit as shown here and I'm going to run a transient and I'm going to just connect this node to ground rather than having another 1k resistor here as in my case. So if I run it I see I have 5 milliamps through this branch that is my short circuit current. So if I go ahead and divide um, my V7 in which I found in the last part, where I found my V open circuit, which is the same as V Thevenin, I can go um, and say 2.5 volts divided by my I short circuit, which is 5 milliamps, is going to give me my R Thevenin value of 500 ohms in my case. So 
then I can go ahead and create the Thevenin equivalent circuit. And the Thevenin equivalent circuit just consists of a single resistor to represent our Thevenin, and it also consists of a load resistor. So I'm going to go ahead and connect that all up. So I'll consider this my R Thevenin. I'll consider this my load. So I'll just switch it around. And I can go ahead and I can move that value down to 500 ohms. So once I have that at 500 ohms, I'm going to have to put this at my V open circuit, which is 2.5 volts. If I go ahead and run this circuit again, I can see my V out at this node is the exact same as it was in the other circuit with the 220 ohm load. So I can go ahead and I can compare the two and I can note any discrepancies between the two. I'm going to repeat this measurement now with 120 ohm load and it should confirm my thinking that this value, the 484 millivolts, is exactly the amount on V out that you got uh, when you created the full um, non thevenin equivalent circuit. So next, we will go ahead and we'll find the AC response and uh, do some boat plots. After this, we're going to go ahead and disconnect our circuit. And then we're going to go and build a circuit as shown in figure 4. Um, it says note that we're not attaching a load resistance, so we're going to switch this one from a load resistor to an actual resistor. So for this circuit, we just need a capacitor. It's the only difference. Rotate that one. For this case, I'll use 2K there. I'll use 1K here, as we had before. And I will just use that one microfarad just fine. So I'll go ahead and I'll connect ground nodes to everything that needs them. There we go. All right, looks like the circuit's good to go. So from here, uh, it says to go ahead and switch this to five volts. Go ahead and do that. Oh, I'll go find. All right, so. Um, it says uh, turn on the DC power supply, set it to 5 volts, um, measure the transfer function, are the results expected? So go here and we can see that my RV out is actually 0 volts and RV in is 5 volts. And we're going to have to explain uh, exactly why that is. Um, I'm, I'm going to leave that to you guys. Uh, it, it's something in this circuit that you've added. Uh, that, that has created uh, the zero volts on the output and you need to find out why that is and exactly what's happening there. So go ahead and pause that again. From there, we're gonna get rid of this. We're gonna delete that branch is fine. We're gonna add an AC sinusoidal and we're gonna connect that up again. All right. It says, note uh, here that we're going to put in 2 volts RMS. So uh, VRMS equals V peak to peak divided by root 2. Um, so in our case, we're actually working with the just the amplitude of, of this source. So it will be half the V peak to peak value. So our V peak to peak value is 2 volts RMS times root 2, which is 2.82 volts, volts peak to peak. And then if you divide that by two to get the amplitude of the wave, um, it should be somewhere around 1.41. So if we can go there, set that just like that. Uh, frequency is fine, uh, phase is fine. So we're going to want to view and show the waveform for the input. This is the input node right here. We're going to want to show that, and we're also going to want to show the output node, which is that one right there, the green one. So from here, um, we can go ahead and run the circuit. And go ahead, we can run the transient. And from here, we can see that our min and our max value for our green wave, and we can get those values. 
we can click on our purple wave and get the min and the max for the purple wave. And we can note any discrepancies between the two. We can calculate our V out divided by our V in. Um, and as well, if we pause the simulation and go back to rewind and then we run our AC analysis, we can actually see that the phase of both the waves is at zero degrees. We can see the phase of the purple wave is at zero degrees the whole way across. If you look at the phase value here, as you're going across, it never really changes. It slightly changes but don't worry about those changes. Um, these are the ones that you're worried about. So you can see the green wave here at the maximum, uh, or sorry, at, at, the, at the lowest possible frequency sweep. It's a 90 degrees at a phase, and it continually, continually gets smaller and smaller. So this um, top wave, is actually the, uh, the the mode plot for the phase, and this top one here, this top green one, is actually the mode plot for the magnitude. So you're gonna have to differentiate between the two. Um, this thing works as as a scope. It, it it just looks a little different than what you're used to uh, in a lab setting. So play around with it and get used to it. Try to figure out uh, what waveforms it are your phase and what waveform is your uh, uh, magnitude just based on the type of filter that you're creating here. So in this case you can see that we have a, a high pass filter. It's passing everything in the high frequencies and it's cutting off things in the low end. So if we go ahead and we can calculate then uh, since we have our V out and our V in we can calculate our A and then using the 20 log 10 of that value, we can calculate our G in uh, dBs. So from there, we can go ahead and create a, a table at a different frequency sweep. So let's go ahead and go back out of here for one second. And we're gonna run the transient again. Ten K Hertz. The next value. So we can you can have our V out and our V in value. And then we'll go back and put in a hundred K value. So we can measure our V out and our V in. Min and our max there, and our min and our max there. Do it for all values up to uh, uh, one megahertz. As you can see, the resolution of the scope is clearly not very good at one megahertz. So um, I wouldn't worry too much about getting a, a proper value for this particular, um, yeah, for this particular one. You could honestly 
what what I would do is just go back. Sorry. Go back and um, I'm just going to run the AC again. And I I can get the same information from this boat plot that I could from the other one. Um, basically showing me how the gain is acting uh, as frequencies increased. Um, so this, this is basically the graph that you're looking to recreate with the values that you get in this table. Um, so yeah, you, you could really realistically take the values from here. Um, I'm just trying to take, take you through the actual process that you'd be using in a lab setting um, to measure the V out and the V in. Uh, in this particular instance, as you just seen, the resolution on the scope clearly isn't very good past about 100 uh, kilohertz. So let, let's just ignore the, the one megahertz value um, and, and take it from this actual boat plot here so we can go in and narrow in and see that our, our phase is near zero, 8.37 uh, um, <laughs> uh, milli. Um, angles or whatever it is milli-degrees and uh, the f the phase sorry the magnitude of the of, uh, of the, in dBs around uh, it's it's so close to zero it's 10 to the negative 9 it's uh, it can be just ignored for all intents and purposes that we have um, so once that's done um, we can, uh, sorry, disconnect this scope and then use the multimeter. Um, in this case, again, we don't really have uh, the proper means to be measuring things with the multimeter. Uh, we could try it. We could uh, tr try to put in a voltmeter here. Across these two nodes. And we can put it in one across this node here. But the only problem with this is you may not get the uh, the values that we're actually looking for because of the fact that um, eh, no seems to work uh, okay. unless the voltmeter is only measuring. But in this case, as you can see, the tool is clearly only meant to measure DC voltages, so we're not getting any readings uh, out of here anyways, so it's, it's no sense to use the multimeter in this case. Um, what you would actually see in a lap setting is that the, the, uh, the oscilloscope can measure at high frequencies, but the multimeter cannot. Um, the multimeter actually trips out around, I believe, seven kilohertz. And that's just because it starts acting uh, as a low pass filter at that point. Yeah, as a low pass filter at that point. So it starts cutting off uh, all the high frequencies and attenuating the signal. So let's go ahead and we will cut all the rest of the components here. Make sure you're saving your circuits as you go. I'm not doing that just for brevity here. Um, and then uh, last but not least, uh, you're just gonna write a, a quick sent couple sentences out uh, about how a breadboard works um, and explain how, how a breadboard actually differentiates between series and parallel components. Um, and, and last but not least, let's uh, explain like what an os oscilloscope actually is doing and uh, what the purpose of, of using a scope is um, in a lab setting. So that is pretty much everything for this lab. I'm sorry about the length. Um, there was some parts that, that are kind of unclear, so I, I hope uh, I cleared some things up for you guys, and uh, good luck. Bye-bye.